Morning, Calvary. Um, hey, we're gonna, I'm going to give you good news. It's for all people. It's especially good if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that is that he's coming back. And uh, the Bible records the promise that Jesus Christ is coming back into this world uh, in the same way that he left, he will return with a strong right arm. And I, I have my illustration today. Stay away from me. If you, if you go to sleep, I have a special power. <laughs> He's coming back. And you have to be ready for his return. You, you, you need to be prepared. Because his return is going to come in judgment against those who do not believe in him and the kingdom of God established for those who do. And you have a lot of warning. And the, the Bible actually tells us that before Jesus died, he predicted, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer at the hands of evil men. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And guess what he did? He did that. And we say if, if Jesus predicted his death and then it actually happened exactly as he said, you should pay attention. Last week when we studied chapter 20, it was about the certainty of the resurrection. They were the words of Jesus on the Wednesday prior to his death on Friday. This episode in chapter 21 follows. It's still Wednesday evening now, and within, you know, 36 hours, Christ is going to be on the cross. It's really stunning to think of Jesus saying these words and caring for his disciples with what he's going to say in chapter 21, knowing, and he does know, in 36 hours, I'll be dead. I'll be on the cross. It is stunning that the ones who are in his mind a day and a half before his crucifixion are the disciples he loves. You should be encouraged by that. Jesus loves us. If you came to church and it, it, it didn't occur to you that God loves you, I, I just want you to know he does. And you might say, I can't imagine that, that God would love me. You don't know what I've done. I'd say, nope, I don't. But I know what I've done. And I know he loves me. And I know he knows what you have done. And I know he loves you. And that he went to the cross and that he was buried and that he rose again is the greatest witness that he loves you. God so loved the world, he gave his son, Jesus. So if you came to church today and you just aren't sure whether God's aware of you, man, I, I could say amen and send you home if you really would grasp the fact that God loves you. He loves you enough to die. The reality is he loves the world enough that he's going to set things right. And he's going to set things right by coming back to this world. And he is going to come back as the judge. This is promised. In chapter 20, we saw this little glimpse. For those of you who study the Bible a lot, in chapter 20 and verse 41, Jesus asked a question, how can they say that the Christ, the Messiah, is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? This is an obscure statement that Jesus said, David, king of Israel, said to my Lord, Messiah, sit at my right hand, his son, sit at my right hand until God makes your enemies your footstool. That is a foreshadowing of a messianic promise that the day is coming when the son of David in his line, turns out to be Jesus, who is both David's son and the son of God, is going to come back to the world, and he is going to make everybody who's been his enemy his footstool. It is prophetic 
apocalyptic language in poetry that the Messiah is eventually going to set all things right and everybody who's been an enemy of Jesus is going to be put in their right place at His feet. Judgment. So every time we think about the enemies of Jesus, it it sort of just does help us that it's going to be made right in time. He has everything in control. Now the setting in chapter 21 is... That is, certain as the resurrection is true, the second coming of Christ is true, and Jesus answers every question about eschatology, and I intend to answer all of your questions this morning, too. (laughs) Yeah, it's the longest answer Jesus gives about what are the signs of your coming. We won't answer all the questions. I don't think Jesus actually intended to focus so much on all the intricacies of eschatology and points of eschatology, that, which means end times, that we often get drawn into. In fact, I'm going to argue for you that Jesus is going to give the general flow of the end times and his coming, and then give about five admonitions or warnings to us that really are the things that he intends his disciples to focus on, he is preparing them and warning them of what is coming. And so he says to them, you know, I'll I'll give them to you quick, and then we'll sort of pick them out as we go. But he says, do not be deceived. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be distracted. And do not be asleep. Those are, are sort of warnings in this unfolding of the passage. I don't see anybody who's fallen asleep yet, so, but we'll be there in about 20 minutes, and I'll come back and look for you, okay? But these are the warnings that Jesus gives. In fact, it opens up in verse 5 where they're walking out of the temple, Jesus and his disciples. This will be the last time he's in the temple, and as he's walking out, In verse 5, while some of them were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. So apparently the uh, disciples were looking at the beautiful temple. This was Herod's temple. And they said, oh, isn't this the most magnificent building? And it was. It was spectacular. One of the wonders of the time. And then Jesus said, verse 6, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Verse 7, They asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? That's the question they ask. And the rest is Jesus' answer about What are the signs of the coming judgment that's alluded to in verse 6 that says the stones of this temple are going to be torn down and there's not going to be left one upon another? As the disciples are saying, man, our temple is awesome. Let me give you a little picture of the temple. The temple was begun in 28 uh, B.C., by Herod the Great. It had been under construction for 50 years when Jesus speaks these words in Luke 21. It was stunning, beautiful, massive in scope and size, beautiful stone that was polished to look like marble. The size of those foundational rocks are massive. The southwest corner of the temple looked down some 400 feet. That's how high it was from the Kidron Valley. It was just enormous, and the scale was awesome. In 70 A.D., 40 years after Luke 21 is spoken, Titus Vespasian, the great Roman general, came after a long siege against the city of Jerusalem and burned the temple of Herod down. There was about 85 years of construction of the temple, 
and overran the opposition to protect the temple of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Josephus says that 6,000 people ran into the temple, and when the temple was burned, they died. He also says that throughout the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, when Jerusalem was overrun by Rome, uh, tens of thousands of people were slaughtered in the streets when Rome conquered Jerusalem 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. That happened. Jesus is going to speak, I think, about that event in this chapter. When he says in, in verse 6, no stone will be left down, um, the disciples are looking at this temple saying, this is extraordinary. And Jesus is saying, it's not going to last. And it must have been stunning to them, it must have been very unsettling for them to think about their temple, the temple in Jerusalem that had been such a monument of human accomplishment, and for them to say, isn't this the most spectacular building? And Jesus say, it's going away. Just give pause for a moment. Think there's probably a lot in our lives that we think about. We think, oh, isn't this great? Isn't this great? At the end, the world's going to fall apart so much that it's all going to go away. And there are going to be people who are so unsettled by the coming of the end of the age in the same way that certainly they were in Jerusalem here. But let's just follow it out. The first thing that Jesus says to them as they ask the question, when will these things be? And I'm sure that they thought it's going to be now, right? It's going to happen now. And they would have had no idea that Jesus says, he doesn't say, it's going to be 2,000 years. There's going to be church in Boulder talking about this 2,023, 2,000 years later. And here we are. So I think the disciples thought it was going to be then. Now, some of this prophecy that follows is for 70 A.D., and some for beyond. The disciples were so confused about this. One more thing is that after Jesus died and rose again, he lived on earth and taught the disciples for 40 days. And in Luke's parallel edition, the book of Acts, we find that he, Jesus is meeting with them after the death, burial, and resurrection. And he's teaching them what to think about. And he's about to ascend into heaven. And in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, they're all gathered out there together, and they asked him, Lord, will you at this time, they, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, will, will this be the time that you restore the kingdom to Israel? And please watch what Jesus said. After the resurrection 40 days, he warns them, it is not for you to know the times or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Could everybody who's a date setter just pay attention. Forty days after the resurrection of Jesus, he told his disciples, don't worry about when. It's not for you to know. The times and season that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but what do you know? You know that you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my, everybody, witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. I want you all just to see that probably like some of you who are here today, you're hankering to know the eschatological questions and answers, and they did too, and Jesus says, not for you to know all the times and seasons, but this is what it is for you to do. You're going to be my witnesses until I come again, and we're going to see it again. So let's carry on. They ask the question, Jesus starts to give the answer, and the answer begins in Luke 21, 8. He said to them, what's the sign? Number one, see that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Don't go after them. Number one, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. At the end of the age, there will be many who will come, saying, I am the Messiah, and this is the time, the time is at hand, the Lord's coming back. There's going to be many in the end throughout history who are going to set dates. And if you Google people who have called themselves the Messiah or set dates for the Lord's return, you'll be stunned to see the list. I did it this week, and I thought I knew a lot. And man, there's a ton of people who have claimed to be the Messiah. 
And I will tell you from personal experience that a number of years ago, I met with a young man who told me he was. And Jesus said, don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. Don't go after them. And I'd say just, you know, don't, don't worry and fixate on certain things and be a date setter and think, oh, this, that, and try to interpret all things. You don't, you don't know the times and seasons. But I'm going to show you some signs that will help you know. But one thing you can be certain is that there are going to be a lot of people who are deceived at the end of the age. And you can listen, write it down, or turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul talks about deception that is going to happen at the end of the age. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul begins to talk about what's going to happen at the end of the age, and he describes the coming of the lawless one, which is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. That is an amazing verse that people who do not love God's truth are subject to deception. And there will be a strong delusion that God sends to them, verse 11, so that they will believe what's false in order that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth and took pleasure in unrighteousness. Paul is describing from his perspective what Jesus is saying is at the end there'll be a great deception. Don't be deceived. That's a good warning for us. Secondly, and when you hear of wars and tumults, don't be terrified. Number two, don't be afraid. Jesus is saying, don't be terrified. There'll be wars. There'll, there'll be tumult. There'll be trouble all over the place. For these things must first take place before the Lord returns. Last phrase is important. But the end will not be at once. This is Jesus giving a clue that the things he's talking about are going to have a near prophetic fulfillment, think 70 AD, and some of them are going to have a longer term fulfillment, think at the end of the age, at the return of Jesus, when the final judgment comes, Jesus is describing what is going to happen in proximate time and in future time. It will not end at once, but don't be terrified, these things have to occur. And so I, I love that Jesus is trying to set up. I have full control. I have this all under my authority. And people are saying we're in the last days. Don't believe it. I want you to be prepared to suffer. And I love that it just is Jesus this close to his own trouble, telling his disciples not to be troubled. He loves you. He loves us. He loved them. Now, in chapter 21, verse 10, he goes on. And he describes not to be discouraged by persecution and suffering. He said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there'll be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilence. There'll be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to synagogues and prisons. And you'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. And I think he's describing what's going to happen to the disciples as they begin to be persecuted. And he says, don't be discouraged because this is going to happen to you. Verse 13 is the word. This will be your opportunity, everybody, to bear witness. Uh, this is Jesus in Luke 21 saying what he says in Acts chapter 1. You're going to receive power and you're going to bear witness. This is going to be your opportunity to bear witness. When the world's falling apart, it is the opportunity for those who know Jesus and love him to speak the truth in love to a world that is deceived. We live in a day. Probably every generation has lived thought their day was the end times. And it's easy for us to look around and say, well, this must be the end times. Because the world's falling apart. And we want to say, well, certainly what's happening in Russia and Ukraine is a sign. 
maybe. COVID, it's a sign. And if you get the vaccine, it's the sign of the... No, yeah. I say we heard all these crazy things. Did you hear them? I heard them. And it's like people are, are gravitate to divine things. And Jesus says, no, no, you don't know. We don't know. It could be the end. Could be the end. I know it's closer. But what I do know is that when the world is falling apart and there are wars and tumults and pestilence, it is our opportunity. This is our day. Calvary Bible Church. This is our day. We live in a day that many people think we're going to hell in a handbasket. That is coming to an end. It's almost over. And I hear that. I know that person is watching the news. Stop watching the news. Read your Bible. What, read your Bible and you know the Lord is going to come back. He's got everything under control. There's nothing going to happen that he doesn't know about, hasn't talked about. The world is going to get worse, not better. There are going to be these events, and we're going to be impacted. And Jesus is telling his disciples, when the end is coming upon us, it is your opportunity to bear witness. And you do not have to think about what you're going to answer. If you're in step with the Spirit, one thing you can know for sure that if you're called upon to give a defense of Jesus, He will help you. He will put words in your mouth. He will give you the wisdom you need, and you, you will be able to stand against those who are adversaries to you. I'll give you the words that you need. Verse 16, you'll be delivered up by parents, brothers, relatives, friends. I mean, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad for the disciples if this is 70 A.D. or for them immediately or at the end, which probably will be both. Verse 17, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. If they hated Jesus, they probably hate his followers. But he promises not a hair of your head will perish. And by your endurance, you will gain your lives. Don't be discouraged by persecution and suffering. This is your opportunity. Look, this is a great warning, and I, I, he loved him enough to tell him the truth, and he does here to his disciples. And then beginning in the next set of verses, in verse 20, he begins to talk about what I think is a reference to the end of the final judgment when Jerusalem will be besieged and it will experience a great desolation that the Bible talks about. And verse 20 it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the, verse 22, if you're watching, these are the what? The days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Uh, Jesus moves from what's going to happen in Jerusalem, I think, to what's going to happen in the end. The days of vengeance of our God, His final coming in judgment, that the Messiah will come and make things right. That's going to occur. And it's what the Bible talks about, that God's going to make things right. And it's going to happen over all the earth. <clears throat> Verse 25, be hard to be a woman with child, nursing. There'll be great distress upon all the earth and wrath against all the people. Okay, what, what's he talking about? He's unfolding the future. I thought what would be helpful is if I shared with you a summary statement that we hold as the church, part of the Evangelical Free Church. We have a statement of faith that we believe, and one of the categories of our statement of faith has to do with the Lord's return. And the summary out of this and all texts is simplified in this way, it says, we believe in the personal, that is, Jesus really himself is going to return, bodily, that he's going to have a glorified body, he'll be in physical but glorified form, as he was as he ascended, and glorious return, it's not going to be in the manger, it's going to be as a triumphant, glorious return of Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ at a time known only to God, demands something until that occurs. 
It demands constant expectancy, like it could happen at any moment. There's very little in our day that reminds us that the Lord could return. We get busy in our stuff. We get in our work. And it's probably been a long time since we thought the Lord could return before Tom finishes preaching. Even so, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> the Lord could return before the end of the day today. The Lord could return before you graduate college. The Lord could return before... It's, an, it's a time known only to God, but it demands constant expectancy and godly living and energetic mission. What is the mission? Bear witness. Great commission. Go into all the world. You shall be my witnesses. When you're under persecution, what do you do? It's your chance to bear witness. There is a God. He loves us. He's coming for us. He came for us. He died for us. He's coming again for us. It's our opportunity. And I think what Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples, that they need to be prepared for this. We know that the Lord is coming, and much of the language here refers to that. Verse 25, there'll be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth and distress in the nation, perplexities because of the roaring in the sea and the waves. <gasps> Climate change. It's true. I mean, I believe it. But it will be climate change. It will be signs in the heaven, people fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming. Verse 26 at the end, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Like it will not be caused by emissions. It will be caused by God who owns it. They'll be, they'll be shaking in heaven. And these will be cataclysmic events in the, in, in the world, in politics, in pestilence, in social relations, among mankind, in deception, in the stars in the sky, in the sea, in the ocean. And the next verse says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory, it will be indisputable that it is God who is creating all of these things at the end of the age. When you begin to see these things take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And then he gave a parable about a fig tree. You see leaves, you know harvest is coming, summer's coming. And that's the way it's going to be when you start to see these signs. You're going to see these signs, and those signs are going to be an indication that when those things start to come to place, the final age is going to be coming. And so there's a phrase that some have been mysterious about. Um, surely no one in this generation, verse 32, will not pass away until all this has taken place. I take that to mean Jesus saying that when these things start to unfold and then they come quickly at the end, that the generation who sees these things at the end will not pass away until they're going to come. The end is going to be quick. I think that's what he's saying. And as a result of that, Heaven and earth will pass away, verse 33. How many of you still have your Bible open and you're looking with me at verse 33? Raise your hand. What does that say? The heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And I, I love that Jesus inserts this here for all of us who are in the room who maybe you're confused about the end times events or you really want to know things and you can't sort it out and you wish somebody would just tell you the chronological path and that's not my purpose this morning to do that, but what I want to give you confidence is that Jesus is saying to his disciples, you should know for sure that I have things in control. And what I say is going to happen is going to happen. My word will not pass away. I am coming back. And in that generation, when all these things unfold, they will see the Son of Man coming in His glory. You can be sure that if I die and I'm buried and I rise again, I will certainly come again in glory to judge, to rescue, and to establish my kingdom. That is going to happen. Lastly, what, what should you do? Verse 34. Watch yourself. Here's one more. 
Watch yourself. Lest you be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. What is Jesus saying? Don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. By the cares of this life, or by drunkenness or dissipation. Okay, I can just tell you that since COVID, substance abuse has risen here in our society. Do you know that? Alcohol use, drug use, opioid use, we're seeing the, the rampant use of medicating pain. And I think Jesus is saying, when you see this world falling apart, do not let yourselves be weighed down with drunkenness and dissipation so that you be caught at the end when the Lord returns like a trap. Dissipation is, think of, <clears throat> it's actually being nauseous because you've been drunk for a long time. It's like you're hungover. It's like you're, you're in a stupor because you've been medicating or partying so much that you're, you're absolutely hung over and like you're just not with us. Don't be that way. And don't be weighed down by the cares of this world. And there are cares. There's cares for health. There's care for the global climate problems. There's care for finances. There's care for what's going on politically. Is the world a mess? Yeah, does it do, do, could we say the world is as bad as it's ever been? The Lord could come tomorrow? Yes. And what does Jesus say? Don't be weighed down with care. Don't be weighed down with care. Why? He's got it. It is going to get bad. But you don't want to be in a position which you, where you are distracted or trying to medicate yourself to put up with the pain so that when the Lord returns, like you're in a trap and you're not ready for his return. It will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. It's not going to be Jerusalem. It's the entire world. The Lord is coming back and all of earth will give an account. I love you enough to tell you that that's going to happen. And I know some of you might be here and you might say like First Peter, where is the promise of his coming? For all these years, people have said the Lord's returning and he hasn't returned yet. And that's part of the deception, I would just tell you, that you get in a place where you say, well, the Lord's not coming, the Lord's not coming, the Lord's not coming, I might as well get drunk. And Jesus actually says, watch yourself, don't get drunk. Be ready, be watchful. It'll come on all people. And then finally, verse 26, there's one more B, and I love that this comes at the end of my message. Okay? So give somebody an elbow and say, stay awake. Why? Stay awake, stay alert. Like have your attention on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing better to help you to stay awake spiritually than cultivating a life of prayer. You get up every morning, say, Lord, this could be the day you come back. Help me to be ready. Lord, this could be the day that I see you. Help me to be preparing my heart that I may be ready to see you. And I want you to know that if you're awake when the Lord returns and you're praying and you're watching, and you're loving his return, you're going to escape all these things that are going to take place. Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm going to rescue you, and you're going to stand before the Son of Man. You're going to be in a position. Who can stand before the Son of Man? Anybody who trusts in him and believes in him. Anyone to whom Jesus is a Savior and a Lord. If he is your Savior, you will stand before him. If he is your Savior, you're going to endure until the end. You're going to keep believing in him. You trust in him? Did you save yourself? This is not rhetorical, okay? Help me out here. Did you save yourself? No. no. Will you save yourself from the end time troubles? No. no. Faithful he is he who called you. He will bring it to pass. You stay awake, you pray at all times, you stay alert, you're not discouraged, you're not deceived, you're not afraid, you know he's in charge, he's coming again in glory, and when I see him, I shall be like him, I shall be with him. Let me close with this verse from 2 Timothy. The Apostle Paul said, I have run my race, he was ready to die, I have fought the fight, I'm going to die now. And henceforth there is laid up for me 
a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous, next word. Okay, don't forget, he's the Lord and he is, the Bible does portray Jesus as the creator of all things, the humble incarnate son of God, baby in Bethlehem, the Lord and teacher and miracle worker, the Savior who went to the cross, and the judge who is coming back. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who love is appearing. We're watching. And I got to tell you, I can get sucked away into the cares of this world. I was so convicted this week, troubled by things in my life, troubled by things around church and in the world. And I, I need to remind myself, and I want to remind you, the Lord has everything in control. And while he was about to go to the cross and suffer greatly, he wanted to tell his disciples, it's going to be okay. It's going to be bad, but I got you. Don't be discouraged. Don't be deceived. Don't be distracted. I'll be back. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the promises of your word. It's hard to just look so quickly at these details that you gave to your disciples, but may the urgency that you gave to them to be ready, <clears throat> to be resting in you, be the way that we feel today. May there be a deep sense of anticipation in our hearts that the Lord could appear at any time. And we want to be ready, prayerful, expectant. So work in our hearts that we would be full of faith. And if there's anybody here unsure of knowing you, I pray your Holy Spirit will just call them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Saved for eternity. Saved from judgment. Saved to be a member of the kingdom of God. Saved to belong to the loving Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, speak to us, we pray. Thank you for what you have done in your first coming and in the coming to come. In Jesus' name, amen.